Master of Deceit from RFA Stories. It's early August 2024, and the trial of Xu Jingwang, which we've been following for more than a year, has just concluded after more than a week of dramatic proceedings. The jury found one guilty on all four counts related to espionage. In this episode, we're doing something different. We'll take you to Brooklyn Federal Court to hear what unfolded during the seven-day trial, the details it revealed about the Chinese spy operation, and the impact of this verdict toward the future cases and discussions on Chinese transnational repression. Papers and recording devices are prohibited in this building. On the first day of the trial, Jane and I up from Washington. I get off the subway, rushing across this hot cement plaza, and I'm wondering, what's going to happen? Guilty? Not guilty? It's also fraught. Over the course of the week, we spend time with Wang's family and watch this circus, the U.S. justice system, in real life. We observe confused jurors, problems with language barriers, a lot of drama, and waiting. That's standing outside the courthouse with a mic, wondering who you'll see and what'll happen. Every day, Mr. Wong would walk up to this enormous building, the Roosevelt Building. It's a modernist building. It was built in, like, 2005. It's huge, silver, concrete. You go inside into this foyer. You go up six flights on the elevator. And then when you walk by, there's this open courtyard. And you look out, and there's a huge American flag, the symbol of justice. It can be very reassuring to see this, like, huge symbol of justice, unless you don't think it's on your side. The prosecutors said that Mr. Wong was living a double life. They said that started in 2005, he deceived people. He was, during that entire time, between 2005 and March of 2022, when he was arrested, he was secretly passing information on to the Ministry of State Security. While at the same time, he was pretending to be an activist in the pro-democracy movement. I remember on the first day when, during the jury selection, we were all sitting there. And then the judge came in and then he said, okay, let the jury in. During the jury selection, there's like 80, 75 of them coming in. And they represented all kinds of people from New York and everyone has to stand up. And it's kind of intimidating to see all these people are going to decide whether you're guilty or not, and they represent America. That's very intimidating. After the first day of the trial, one of the jurors came out, two of them came out at the same time, and one of them said to the other, are you coming back tomorrow? And the second one said, yes, you are too, right? And the first one said, what do you, you know, huh? And the second one said, you have to come back to trial. We're on the jury. Everyone has to be there every day. That's what the judge said. And then the juror, other one said, oh, okay, I'll be there tomorrow. The juror had no idea what was going on. Another person on the jury said that they didn't understand anything because it's not their first language. And they didn't understand the English when they tried to get off the jury. But the judge said no, they had to stay. So there were at least two people who absolutely did not know literally what was going on. And then the rest of them, they seemed engaged during the trial, but it's very hard to gate. It's very hard to know how much they were following. Meanwhile, the information that's being presented throughout the day one and day two of the trial are these extremely complicated text messages and messages sent by WeChat. Plus, all of it is done in that typical trial ease language which is that, first of all, they provide all these details about some aspect of the case, explaining nothing. And then at the very end, they tell you everything about why it was important, all these things that you just heard. And then you think, oh, I really should have been paying attention before. Now I would know why this matters. And I'm not sure how close they are, these jurors, how close they've been to reaching that sort of peak attention level. But it still is up to them to decide. That's Yan Hua, Wang's ex-wife. They're still very close and live together in Flushing, 
she came to court with Xu Jing Wang. On the second day of the trial, I saw them sitting together on the bench. Yan Hua was wearing a tiger print shirt and a pale blue windbreaker. She told me she now understands better what's going on with her ex-husband's case, and she won't be coming to court anymore. When I asked why, she shook her head. Stay away from politics, she said. It's a real mess, a real mess. She said she didn't know what Wan had been doing for years, and she said that he'd brought trouble on himself and should never have gotten involved with those bad people, bad friends, the kind who supposedly work for the MSS. The evidence the prosecutor presented in court was revealing, including emails, WeChat messages, phone call records, and Wang's own confessions to undercover about his long relation with the MSS agents. Evidence shows that the MSS agent helped Wang set up an email account when he was in China. Wang would write diary entries in the draft folder, which the MSS could then access and read. Some of these diaries, which the prosecutor called intelligence reports, contain very, very personal conversations with pro-democracy activists in New York. For example, one dissident shared his wish to secretly return to China for his father's funeral, and there were also private conversations from a dissident's birthday party. I remember the prosecutor turn around,、uh, pointed at Wang Shujing, this guy. He betrayed his friend. He lied and lied to the FBI, lied to the law enforcement, all that. And then it was Wang Shujin's lawyer take the stand, and he asked Wang to stand up and presenting him as Professor Loves America. Professor Wang、um, believe in democracy. Xu Jun Wang brought a picture of a cat to court, pointed to it, and told us, "This is Boss He, the MSS agent." He claimed that his daughter's cat and the MSS agent had the same last name in English, which he suggested was why the FBI made a mistake. One of the defense strategies was to show that the FBI made many mistakes and that things are lost in translation. The defense lawyer pointed at the FBI agents during the trial a few times, and said, "Look, they're not native Chinese speakers. They are confused." Wang's son, Ho Long Wang, was wearing a black short sleeve shirt with big jeans. He took time off from his sushi chef job in Flushing to attend the trial. And he says his father was framed. Wang's family was angry, and the courtroom was tense. One of the people at the courthouse made jokes about Chinese spies. If the CCP sent someone, you'd never know it. He said. Told us he doesn't work for the Chinese government, but it's the kind of talk that makes people uneasy. Fair trial, and we'll see that our client is very pro-democracy. Zachary Margulis Anima was Wang's lawyer, and he was all swagger at the beginning. Meanwhile, Wang was trying to get people at the courthouse copies of his book. He wanted them to know he's a writer. Here's his friend Wang Junhao, a prominent member of the pro-democracy movement. He says he's the only one who can save himself. Yes, in the courtroom, he cannot trust the other one else. So you 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 will see, you know, in the lunch, he sit by himself. Nobody talk to him, even his lawyer. I think his lawyer angry at him because you know that his lawyer asked him to tell the truth, but、uh, he gave the wrong evidence. But It's not a point, you know. It's a the point is that he's my friend. He he has done a lot of things for the Marxist movement. Wang's friend, Wang Junhao, said yes. He gave information to the Chinese government, but it was of no value. The 
The trial lasted a week. They showed a secret video of Wong talking about the MSS, and they sealed the courtroom so an undercover agent could testify. Then the jury of six men and six women began deliberations. As one of them told me later, they fought. What was it like? Did you guys argue a lot? It was contentious the first day, yes. Yeah, it was hard. All right, thank you. Take care. Nice to meet you. One of the jurors who speaks Mandarin said the jury was split at first. She explained that they had intense discussions on the first day about two main questions. Did Wang really act as a foreign agent? And did he lie to law enforcement? Only us Chinese people really understood. One juror was from Hong Kong, and myself, I'm from Guangdong. We understand some of the context relating to China. The other jurors, they're all really foreigners. They generally thought that he did commit crimes. And regardless of the reasons, if he did those things, he was guilty. I'm also from China, so I can understand his situation. Like he mentioned, he has family in China. You know what I mean? Even if he had some contact with officials in China sometimes, does that really mean he provided intelligence? So that's what we were discussing, whether he was really spying or if he just accidentally mentioned some sensitive things between friends. Jurors with a Chinese background seem sympathetic to Wang's situation. They saw his actions in the context of Chinese society, where lines can sometimes be blurred. But in the end, they all agreed on the verdict. The courtroom was quiet. Wong straightened his tie. Guilty, said the jury on the first count. Then, guilty. Wong closed his eyes, the way you do before being struck by someone. Guilty. Guilty. It was like watching someone receive a series of physical blows all unfolding in that wood-paneled courtroom. After the verdict, we rushed outside the courtroom and waited. Wong came out, with one hand in his pocket and the other on his can. He stopped to talk to us. I believe the verdict is unjust. They made up a lot of things. The main issue was that there wasn't enough evidence to prove these four men really are MSS officers. These four national security officials said I was in contact with them. It's not even clear if they really are national security officials. So the way they got their evidence is flawed. If the evidence is flawed, then it's unfair. This is a travesty of justice. The man we'd come to know had told a story about himself as a professor and an author. And after the verdict, he said he had his next book planned, a prison memoir, as yet untitled. Then he climbed into a car and drove away. His sentencing date is set for January 9th, and he faces up to 25 years in prison. Join us next time for the conclusion of our five-part series, Master of Deceit. Hungry for more RFA podcasts? Want to hear interviews and analyses with RFA journalists and find out how RFA stories are born? Do you want to explore the sillier side of RFA's content with bad puns, memes, and mindless banter? Mindless? Uh... If you said yes, then check out the RFA Insider podcast. Visit rfa.org slash English slash Insider or find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. So yeah, check it out. Woo-hoo!